Firstly, just before we get started, the usual disclaimer, uh, what we're about to go through is general advice, not specific to individual circumstances. So please take that on board. Some of these things will, may apply to your different circumstances. Um, before you implement anything we talk about today, make sure you go through it in detail with your advisor, as the case may be. This is more an identification of the sort of opportunities to think about for you to then follow up. Uh, what I'd also like to do today is introduce uh, our internal Superman. Uh, so Neil, a, uh, I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, but uh, he's our go-to man at all things super within Wilson Patera. So Neil, a, welcome. Uh, yes, there, as part of some of the uh, things we're going to go through today, um, there will be a crossover between some of the things that I say and some of the things that Neil a says, but certainly from a detailed perspective towards the back end, of the, of the the second half of the slides, uh, Neil A's um, contribution will be invaluable. So thanks again, Neil A. Um, just some minor um, things to mention along the way before we get started. This is being recorded uh, and will be forwarded to each of you after the session, so you can refer back to the slides at your leisure. Um, along the way, uh, I've also got a Q and A screen open, so if you do have any questions, feel free to click me a quick note, we'll stop at the relevant time and um, for the benefit of everybody here, be able to answer those questions. Um, obviously, if there's any feedback as we go, let us know and um, we can press on. So the first thing to mention is the first item on the slide there talks about year-end tax planning considerations. Um, it is our practice and our view that, you know, whilst we are at the end of a tax year, tax planning is actually a year round activity. So structuring and identifying opportunities in the lead up through as people progress through the year is something that we always focus on. Um, it's just that we're at that time of the year where our year end checklist of things that we should have thought about during the year really comes to the table. So that's that's part of what today is about. Um, we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of the different structures. Um, given the timing of where we're at the end of the year, it's probably too late to be changing structures this 2023 year, but it's certainly relevant for some feedback as to what might be thought about early in the new year for the coming times. Um, same with the asset ownership, it's probably too late to certainly change property ownerships. We can talk about some of the share ownerships in your various entities, loans, distributions to kids, all that sort of thing we will um, touch on as we go. Yep. Uh, um, the usual checklist of things just to make sure you've considered as we approach 30 June are the usual suspects. So for example, if we have some, if we've had a really, really good year uh, and next year is perhaps looking a little bit soft, uh, we may decide to delay um, the invoicing of clients until the 1st of July. Um, the reason for that is, for example, you've got already got a million dollars income in 2023, you've got another $500,000 worth of invoice that you could issue. Um, if you put it in this year, it's gonna cause you a headache. Put it into next year, perhaps less of a headache and more planning opportunities around that. So that's the what, in, as far as this title is concerned, deferral of income. The thing to consider here is bird in the hand stuff. So for example, Ty has an invoice that he could issue to Neil A today for 500,000. Neil A pays me, I'm happy, I've got money in my bank. If I have a tax bill, I can cover off on that. If I wait until the 1st of July, yes, it's not far away, but Neil A's circumstances may have changed. If I issue him a $500,000 invoice at that point in time, his cash flow position might be different. I might actually not get paid. So tax is one thing, uh, but certainly, um, from my perspective, if there's risk around the receipt of those, the payment for those services, <laughs> you're better off having money to pay tax rather than not having the money in the first place. Um, the other things to can, that are mentioned here, maximising deductions. Uh, I'll let Neil A talk in more detail about this when we get further along in the presentation. Superannuation is, is a key investment and savings opportunity. Uh, again, I'll let Neil A talk about the context, but our view is superannuation is an investment vehicle. It's taxed concessionally. Let's use it to 
the maximum extent we can. Uh, and there are certainly some tax opportunities as far as making contributions before 30 June. Neil A again will cover off in this uh, cover off this in more detail, but to make tax deductions recently, the tax department or the government has allowed us to make significantly more contributions into super above the annual threshold if we have been below in previous years. Neil, I'll leave that to you for later on, but just to mention it as a, a deduction side of things. Um, one of the, so the, the usual things to work through as far as maximising deductions, presumably everybody's in the SME space. In that context, whatever you spend money on now that's a normal expense, even though it may relate to the next financial year that we're in, is a tax deduction now. So from again, from a planning perspective, if we've had a really good year and we want uh, to perhaps mitigate the tax cost this year, incurring expenses is what we're talking about. Prepaying some expenses, the obvious one, and those who know me will know where I'm going with this, accounting fees is a perfect example. Should you wish to prepay accounting fees, we're more than happy to accommodate it. Uh, and obviously it gives you a tax deduction in the 2023 year, even though the services may not be performed until 2024. Um, insurance, prepaying of interest on loans, all those sort of things could be considered if it's an advantage as far as balancing up between this year and next year is concerned. Um, one of the other items that may be uh, considered for those of you that are in business and have employees running around. If you have some employee bonuses that may not be paid until next year, but you are indebted to the staff member this year, if you pass a resolution to the um, in relation to the employee bonus, let's say Nilo's done a really good job, I'm going to give him 50 grand, but it's going to be in the July payroll, ordinarily, that expense would then be in the 2024 year. But by doing a resolution this year, it allows us to claim that tax deduction this year because it's owed to Neil A. So again, it's a timing thing to consider. Um, the other things to um, perhaps consider in relation to running a business, please run through the accounts receivable any of, those, any of those that are genuinely bad, get them off your books and tidy it up. Again, why pay tax on something you're not going to get? Stock, likewise, if you have some stock that's slow moving and or redundant, consider writing that stock off. Again, no use paying tax on something that has no value. Um, and this other significant change that has occurred, uh, that, sorry, that there's a change on the 30th of June is right now, if you can install a piece of equipment that's used in your business that ordinarily will come under the depreciation rules. So let's say for argument's sake, a farmer wants to buy a tractor, it's $100,000, it's installed and available for use before 30 June, that $100,000 is a tax deduction now. If we install that tractor and, and is available for use in July, we are required to write that off under the normal small business depreciation rules, which are less generous. So from the 1st of July, that unlimited write-off changes to $20,000. So if there's that significant capital expenditure you're looking to make, certainly there may be significant advantages from a timing perspective for tax to bring that forward. And certainly I understand that we have 23 days to go and deciding today to go and buy a $100,000 tractor doesn't necessarily mean it will turn up and um, and be able to do its thing. Uh, cool. Uh, so we talked about um, deferring income. Uh, one of the things to consider is from an income perspective, if you do invoice and you're in the professional services and you're in business, if you invoice somebody before 30 June for services that are yet to be performed or for goods that are yet to be provided, that income is not accessible, generally not accessible to the entity. So um, if you did have somebody who said, oh, we want an invoice before 30 June, you're not necessarily up for a tax cost associated with that. Um, there's also some um, depreciation concessions that are briefly mentioned at the bottom of this slide. I won't go through the detail for that right now. Um, we talked about looking at your 
deductions going through your debtors, looking at your stock, all those sort of things. That's what's listed on this slide. Um, and we touched on the ability to claim personal superannuation contributions. Uh, the other thing to be conscious of, we are doing a uh, a process within Wilson Pateras at the moment where we're looking at all of our clients that operate through trusts and ensuring that we're reviewing the distribution possibilities for those trusts amongst family members and or corporate entities. Uh, and it's very important and an increasing focus of the tax department that those are executed prior to 30 June. So keep an eye on your inbox. There'll be lots of um, electronic signatures required in the lead up to 30 June for your trust. If you're not sure where that's at, please speak to your advisor, but it's a process just for comfort purposes that we absolutely um, have in play uh, within our organisation. Uh, in that context, for those that um, are in the appropriate circumstances, with a trust, obviously it can distribute amongst family members, but it can also allocate income into uh, another entity, e.g. a company and be taxed accordingly. Please, uh, again, for our internal purposes, we'll be re reviewing that for all of the clients and making determinations as to what does or doesn't work. But again, from the tax department perspective, it's very important moving forward. If you are allocating money to a company to try and mitigate some of the tax costs for the profit in the trust, the flow of funds goes into that entity. Um, it may have been practice in earlier years to say, oh, the company gets $100,000, but we won't put the money into it. We'll work it out later on. That's no longer the, the case. We really need to make sure that we're funding those distributions into the companies. And likewise, there's an increasing focus from the tax department that if you're allocating money to children or parents out of the trust, that there's a flow of funds that relates to that distribution, or alternatively, there's an acknowledgement of that person's entitlement. That's part of our process we're doing internally here for each of you. So again, if you're not seeing something coming through or it hasn't been communicated yet, feel free to reach out and we'll, um, we'll fill in the gaps for you. Uh, trust the beneficiaries. So this is um, probably preaching to the converted, but within all your trust structures, we do a review each year as to what your trust can and can't do with different types of income. And we make sure when we do those distribution resolutions, we're looking at the best outcome. Won't go into too much detail here. Um, it's about the, the most tax effective result and we're on it. <laughs> um, capital gains tax, another important consideration. Uh, as we approach 30 June, we may be considering whether we have some capital gains on things that we've sold during this particular year. Please consider if you do have some unrealized losses on investments, it may be prudent to realize those losses now so that those losses offset against any gain that you have made during this tax year. There'd be nothing worse than, for example, paying tax on $100,000 that you've made this year, and next year you make a loss of 100,000, but it can't offset against the previous year, so it gets carried forward. Not ideal from a timing perspective. Um, it might, also be a good opportunity to speak to your advisors and, and or your financial advisors around the structuring and ownership of some of your investments. Moving forward, it may not be appropriate that XYZ, you know, BHP for example, is owned by an individual, by a trust or by a company. It might be better that the ownership of that investment is best elsewhere. Now's a really good time to assess that ownership so that you can make some changes now, particularly if there's no capital gains, and move it into a more preferred environment. So from company to trust, from trust to company, or in particular, as Neil A will touch on later on, there's a possibility to make some contributions into super. And for example, if I own BHP and there was no capital gain on it at the moment, I might be able to do a transfer from me into my super fund so that moving forward, that ownership and the capital gain and the dividends is in a more friendly environment. But I'll let Neil A talk about the, the possibility to do that. Um, the uh, Just going back to the starting point of the presentation today around 
the tax planning being uh, an all year process. It's also a good opportunity given that we're approaching 30 June to assess how we are structured generally. So um, because of the increasing focus on distributions out of trusts and potential tax inefficiencies and future sale of the business that you're in, et cetera, et cetera, increasingly we're seeing clients consider operating their businesses from a company instead of from a trust. Not that it's going to happen this tax year, but it's an important consideration as early as possible in the new, new tax year to contemplate whether we can do some rollovers into from a say a trust into a company uh, there are some pros and cons so it's important you understand all of that but if a business generally has significant working capital requirements it's our experience that that ownership is generally best in a company environment rather than a trust and we can talk through the the difference for capital gains purposes if you're looking to sell in the future there's also some timing opportunities perhaps if your business is growing to um, change from a trust into a different structure to enable you to offer equity positions to other people if you need you know, capital to grow or you want to offer shares to employees etc cetera, etc cetera. you can't do that as a family trust but rolling it up into a company may be a really good opportunity to provide for that next part of your journey uh, in business a lot of detail behind that but just to flag it as something to consider um, so this is just a, a screenshot, which I'll let you look at a bit later on, just uh, the difference between allocating income to a person or income into a company. You can see there's, you know, at 30% money going into a company has got a big difference compared to the tax rate if it's in, allocated to an individual. But again, it's important that if you're going to undertake this exercise, that this so-called bucket company really, in the terminology I'd rather use, it's an investment company. And how it receives money is you contributing in this manner makes a big difference to the amount that's invested. So as an example, we, we take this scenario here and on an after-tax basis, if we have $500,000 that's gone to an individual, 188 is lost in tax, we've got $312,000 to invest. If we use the company option, we've got $380,000 to invest obviously a much better starting point. As I said, please review these things later on. Uh, this is the slide just talking about the instant asset write-off that ends on 30 June. Um, and uh, there I, we do have one question here, Nele, which is in relation to the additional tax on super. Um, yes. I'll, come, I'll come back to that a bit later on. It's, it's about the Div 293 scenario over 250 extra tax I'll let you explain that when you get to that point but uh, what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Nila everybody obviously if there are other queries and things we do have a session at the end where we can bounce backwards and forwards in the meantime if something occurs to you please flick us a note in the Q&A uh, but Nila uh, over to you for your part of the presentation. Thanks Ty. Uh, hi everyone um, I'll just start uh to explain all the matters in relation to the self-managed super fund so that you can have an idea about uh, how it can be tax effective way to utilize those uh, uh, those strategies. Uh, this strategy is, uh, this slide just talks about the tax rate in a super fund, which normally says that zero to 15% tax payable on the taxable income. So uh, if, this, if the super fund have any income, for example, any normal interim interest, dividends, rental, um, any sorts of income, local income, uh, it would be taxed at 0% if the fund is in 100% pension, but the maximum is 15%, even though there is a pension involved. So the maximum tax rate is 15%. And in relation to the capital gains, um, uh, again, if it's 100% in pension, then there is no uh, tax payable. But if it's the 100% uh, in accumulation, uh, which I'll come across to mention that matter a little bit late, but then it's a uh, maximum 10%. So uh, compared to the other vehicle, the, the other you know, company structures or the trust structures, uh, the self managed super funds uh, provide much better tax savings point of view. So something to understand, like this is a basic slide to explain the what's the tax savings um, in a self managed super fund compared to other entities. So that's something to look into it. 
Yeah, so the context I like to use, Neil, in, in this scenario is if you put $100 into super, after tax, you generally have $85 available to invest. If it's done in a company, you have 70 cents available to invest, obviously a big difference already. And if the investment is generally in a trust or a person's name, it's $53 left to invest. So obviously the compounding effect of that is significant over the journey. True, true. So the yeah, compounding over the years would be much better. Yep. Uh, this strategy is about carried forward unused concessional contributions, um, which means what it says is uh, if your member account balance, and that includes uh, super, like a pension and accumulation, uh, but your super total balance is less than 500,000 as of 30th of June 2022 financial year, which is a previous financial year. And if you haven't utilized your concessional contributions cap since first of the July 2018, which is uh, some years back. So what you can do is you can claim, you can make the concessional contributions before 30th of June, 2023. Uh, and you can claim that deductions against your individual income under your personal tax return. Uh, let's understand this by this example. So for example, John and Susie have a self-managed super fund. Uh, they haven't made any super contributions in 2022 because the business was having uh, not that much income. Um, so for 2023 financial year, John and Susie can make 55,000 each in deductible super contributions because 27,500 was the concession contributions cap for 2022 financial year and 2023 financial year. So 55,000 in total, each member are making contributions in a super fund so total 110,000 is deposited into super fund by making these contributions. But how it works is, so the business income in 2023 was let's say 300,000, but because the super contributions was made for 110, the income, that net taxable income of the, the business is around 190,000. For the simplicity of the calculation of the tax, we kept it 30% of the tax payable, 57,000. Um, and in the super fund, because it's a concessional contributions, the, the tax is payable 15% in the super fund. So what happens is there is a tax savings of 16,500 straight away. Why? Because if that contribution wouldn't be made, then the, the company would have paid 90,000 of the tax because 30% of 300,000 um, compared to now, uh, 57,000 is paid in a company and 16,500 in super fund. So there is a 16,500 is a net savings. Now, a couple of things to be considered in this one is for division 293 purposes, this catch-up concession contributions will be counted as a concession contribution. So uh, I will, to answer that question, which is asked in Q&A, and also to provide more information about division 293 tax is ATO has a particular formula to work it out. What is a division 293 tax related income, which is a made of various income, like your taxable income, which is your assessable less any deductions, rental, trust distributions, and all. The total of all, if it's more than 250,000, then division 293 tax applies. And what is division 293 tax is? Generally, you end up paying 15% tax on the concessional contributions. But because of division 293 tax, you end up paying another 15% tax on that concessional contributions you made. So in this particular example, if John or Susie individually have more than $250,000 worth of taxable income, um, then they would end up paying 30% tax on these deductions, on these contributions. So something to be mindful of that. Now, the question was that um, my income is greater than 250 k and the ATO claims additional tax on my super, which is correct, 15% additional tax. Can I avoid this additional tax by splitting my super with a partner? Uh, to answer is yes and no. So what happens is because that tax is calculated on your personal income, which means if you wish to avoid an income coming to you, for example, trust distribution, if you can avoid the, you, what you're trying to do is to stay beyond the 250,000 threshold. So if you can reduce your income by any way, then you can save the division 293 tax. So if you can allow to get the distribution to your wife, that's one of the things to consider or other things. But if you can't, then unfortunately, there is no uh, uh, kind of escape from that. Having said that, yes, the 
the contribution split can be possible with the wife, and that would get you an additional tax offset under your personal tax return, but that would be different compared to the Division 293 tax. Now, Division 293 tax, uh, when you, you have an option to pay out of your self and super fund as well. So what you might be able to do is you can use that money from the super fund to pay it to the ATO for that tax. So that might get you a little bit of liquidity uh, and, and an option that you don't want to pay out of your personal funds. Um, so something to be looking into that one. The second one is the double dip contribution. The double dip contribution is that you can, you can make a contribution, like a contributions cap for 2023 financial year is 27,500, for example. So if you think that you have sold uh, a property or you have significant amount of gain or tax payable situation in 2023, but not in 2024, what you might be able to do is you might be able to claim uh, $27,500 worth of contributions for 2024 financial year, you can claim in 2023. So instead of claiming 27,500 in 2023, you can double dip it by claiming 55,000 in 2023. And how it works is you need to make those second set of contributions, which is for the 2024 financial year in a June month, which we are all in. So anytime if you make it now before 30th of June, then you can claim $55,000 worth of deductions in 2023 financial year. And 27,500 of the contributions will be declared uh, for the 2024 financial year. So in me, which means you can't claim any deductions in 2024 financial year. So something to look into that one, but you can have $55,000 worth of deduction in 2023 so that you can uh, kind of avoid your avoid paying tax in 2023. Uh, that's something to, to look into that. Um, and, and Neil, just to confirm, you're also able to top up on top of this with what you underclaimed in the previous years, correct? That's exactly forward. right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, in that particular case, there is a threshold of 500,000. In this option, there is no threshold, which means you should you can able to do it regardless. So that's the only difference between those. But if a particular person's member balance is less than 500,000, they can do both. Yes, that's correct. Cool. Next slide. Uh, yes, please. Uh, the work test requirements. So this is something to be aware of just in case um, if you want to make a contributions, but you need to be aware of the work test requirements. So the what is a work test is uh, the new legislation applies, uh, which says that from 1st of the July 2022 onwards, you don't need to meet any work test uh, if you are 75 or under, um, uh, with an exception, of, so if you're making a non-concessional contributions or salary sacrifice contributions, you don't need to meet any work days. Uh, the only work days you would require if you are between age 67 to 75. Um, and that only you need to meet the work days if you want to make the personal concessional contributions. Um, so that's something to look into it. But if you are less than 67 years of age, uh, you don't need to meet any work days. Previously, it was a different case altogether. So now it's a little bit lenient. Um, to make a contribution in a super fund. And once you turn 75, uh, that then you only make a contribution, which is called mandated contributions, which is only uh, the super contributions guarantee contributions. So that's the only thing you can make after you turn 75. Um, the another strategy is called downsizer contributions. So this is a strategy which applies to you if uh, you are maybe 75 years of age, uh, or uh, your member account balance is more than 1.7 million. Because in both situations, you don't have much of the options to contribute more funds into the super fund because it, these two matters restrict you to make a contributions. But the downsides of contributions may allow you to make three, up to 300,000 per member uh, into the super initial contribution if you meet some of those eligibilities. Um, those eligibilities are... There is no maximum age, but the eligible age from 1st of the January 2023 is 55 years and older. So if you are 55 years of age, um, then your and your spouse's main residence is sold and you have owned at least for 10 years. Um, and then once you sell it, once the property is settled, 
within 90 days of settlement if you make these contributions in a super fund. Um, and then it's called downsize it, but you don't have to downsize it. So for example, people sell the house and they buy bigger house if they want to, but it's still, they can make a contributions because there is no restrictions of you that you have to actually downsize. So there is a way where you can top up the super fund balance by making these contributions and which allows you to do it. Now it's better easier because now it's 55 years of age. Previously it was 65. So now it's things are getting better. Woohoo, I'm in. <laughs> uh, yep. So, okay, the, the next strategy is starting a pension in the super fund. Um, what, what is it says, if you're eligible uh, to commence a pension, then you would have significant amount of uh, tax savings in a super fund. Uh, so uh, previously we mentioned that you would be paying zero to 15% tax in your super fund on your income um, uh, and, uh, and a zero to 10% tax in capital gains. When, when I was referring to zero uh, is in relation to these pensions and we will look into it in a detail in a couple of slides. But what it says is, so if you reach the preservation age and retire, uh, there is a table, it depends upon when you, what's your date of birth um, and it, it determines whether you reach your preservation age or not. Uh, but also you have to retire. Then the second category is 60 years and retire. And the third option is 65 years old. You don't have to retire if you're 65 years old. So if you meet any of this eligibility, then you should be able to commence a pension. Uh, there are different sort of pensions, uh, transition to retirement and a full account-based pension. We will look into it a little later. The pension consideration, uh, as I said, it's a tax environment. Uh, increase the inv uh, investment return due to franking credits being refundable. We'll look into that. Uh, minimum pension payment each year must be based. So the only uh, rule that you have to follow that if you commence a pension, every year you have to take a minimum pension. It will be calculated on the basis of your age um, and, the, and, the, and the pension amount. Uh, it will be given and then, yeah. Uh, compared to not starting a pension, which is, uh, it is obvious that you don't get that tax savings. Um, and no requirement. Uh, so, yep, that's it. Uh, I'm just looking at the question, sorry. Um, by the way, relating to the splitting super question, my income is not from business. I'm paid uh, by my employer. Uh, I've oh, yeah, already answered. answered. Oh, it's, it's been answered, that's good. Yeah, cool. Uh, but, okay, cool, that's fine, it's right. all good. All right. Okay, uh, the example I'm referring to the slides now. So an example with how beneficial the pension could be. So in 1992, someone bought 10,000 CBA shares. And at that time, uh, believe it or not, $1.49 per pop. <laughs> Is that right? Jeez. <laughs> yeah, actually I looked into it. Um, and uh, the purchase price was approximately $15,000. Um, then a person commenced a pension in 2020 financial year or 2022 financial year in that matter. And now the fund is in 100% pension. So if the person has an accumulation account balance since 1992 up to now in 2020 in this example, always been accumulation account, uh, but just now or 2020, uh, that person commences a pension. Um, and then after commencing a pension, the person sold it for $101. So for example, for $1 million. So the capital gains were $985,000. But the tax payable in super fund completely nil. Why? Because the fund is in hundred percent pension phase, and the the capital gains tax will be exempted from the the tax point of view because you are in hundred percent. Ninety eight thousand five hundred tax saved right there. <laughs> That's right, and which you can invest into something else, uh, mm. which you have further tax savings again. So uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, it's more of a compounding benefits of if you have the pensions in place. Um, so, okay. Um, the next one, so capital gains in a superannuation fund. Uh, through this example, we're just trying to explain uh, with pension and without pension, the difference. Uh, again, uh, the example BHP shares bought um, more than 15 years, sold it with a capital gain of 500,000. Uh, so how the super fund calculates the tax is Outside super fund, there is a 50% discount under individuals and the trusts and whatnot. Um, but in a super fund, it's a one third discount. 
So once it's one third discount, which means 500,000 gain, one third discount applied. So $166,667 worth of discount applied. So 333,333 is the remaining. Then 15% tax is payable on that amount, uh, which is around 50,000 50, tax, which is the 10% of the original 500,000 gain, which means it's a 10% of the effective tax rate. If, if that's easier to, to, to understand and, and calculate easily. So that the fund ends up paying 10% tax of 500,000. The other example is if you are on 100% pension, the same situation you end up paying zero tax. So you will straight away save uh, $50,000. So that's a difference uh, between those two uh, situations. Um, buying a property uh, in superannuation funds. So uh, some, some people are having a, like making, going a business or they, they prefer investing through the uh, real estate. Uh, super fund can be a really effective uh, vehicle because of the same reason which we discuss in relation to CB or BHP shares, because if you hold the property for longer term, um, and then when you dispose it, um, uh, you, you can have a significant amount of tax savings. In this example, we are talking about uh, John and Sarah. Sarah bought a commercial property of worth of 900,000. Um, they had 400,000 in the super fund. So they, they took the loan uh, for 500,000. John was running a business through that property so that because it's a commercial property, you can run it like you, you can be a related party and still own the, use the Superfund property. You can't do it if it's a residential property. So uh, you can't live in the residential property owned by the Superfund, but the commercial property is a separate matter altogether. Yeah. So no beach houses in Superfunds. Basically, yeah. <laughs> people would think that way. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the super fund made the loan repayments and the other expenses from the rental income. Um, and then some years when the business was sold, the properties were sold along with the business. Uh, but because the super fund was in pension phase, uh, the super fund ends up paying nothing. So uh, that's, uh, that's a kind of example. Um, uh, now, when are we talking about 100% in a pension? Uh, I just want to draw like draw your attention to something. Which, now, these days, recently, uh, ATO come up with the transfer balance cap, which was started with 1.6 mil in 1st of the July 2017, which is increased to 1.7 million, uh, which is in 1st of the July 2021. And from 1st of the July 2023, it's going to be 1.9 mil. What are these figures is you can have up to 1.9 if you want to keep the funds in a pension. So you can only have tax-free benefit up to 1.9 mil. So if your member account balance is less than 1.9 mil, you are in 100% pension because you can commence pension from the whole amount. But if your member account balance is, for example, 2 million, you can only use 1.9 mil uh, in your pension and the 100,000 will remain in the accumulation account. So when ultimately, all the tax will be calculated in a proportion matter. So the amount in the pension account will be tax exempt, the proportion of the income, and the amount in the accumulation account, that proportion income will be taxable. Again, uh, it's still a good savings because uh, the proportion in the accumulation account most likely will be less. So uh, how that proportion will be calculated, we have to apply the actuarial certificate um, and then actuary will let us know what proportion of the income will be tax exempt on a basis of the pension account balances. So definitely, Nele, in my experience, it's still a significant advantage if you're fortunate enough to have a, a large superannuation balance. You obviously say in this context, have one point, the earnings on 1.9 tax free and the earnings on the balance of your fund, if that was another 1.9, it's still only taxed at 15%. So if you took that out of super to just bring it down to the 1.9 tax free threshold, you're going to have an entirely different tax rate on the on the excess. So generally, it's best to leave it where it is. That's right. And if the two members and they both are in pension, uh, it's multiplied by two. So yeah. it's a significant amount. It can be, uh, you know, left in the super fund to invest through so that we can have the tax savings. So uh, if it's used correctly, uh, the self-financed super fund could be really effective uh, vehicle. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And there's, I'm not sure if it's in a later slide too, but if I can, one of the other strategies that we do employ is if one, one spouse has a really significant superannuation balance and say is in pension phase, and the other spouse has a smaller balance, 
depending on people's age and employment status and that sort of thing, there's a possibility to withdraw from one member, so the higher balance member, take it out of the fund, potentially no tax payable, or likely no tax payable, and put it into the other person's balance. So what we try and do is get them as, as level as we can. That's right. That's right. Uh, we call it as the recontribution strategy. Uh, that's the very effective way. Uh, that's right, Ty. It's a very effective way to uh, to reduce one of the members' uh, balance, which is more than the transfer balance excess, and to put it into the other balance who has a lesser amount mm -hmm. of the yeah. uh, member account balance, which is which is really yeah. Mm -hmm. With this slide, uh, the franking credit three funds. So what we are trying to explain here is. Um, because the franking credits generally calculated on a tax, uh, a company tax rate, which is more than 15% uh, than the 15% tax in the super fund paid. So there is always uh, a tax refunds if you're investing only from the shares with the franking credits payable. So let me explain it in an example so that it makes more sense. So for example, uh, Advert invest into blue chip dividend paying companies through the super fund. So the super fund only invests into shares in this example, uh, and they're only blue chip companies, which means mostly they're providing the, the dividends, uh, fully frank dividends or partly frank dividends in that matter. Most of the funds tax is offset by the dividend franking credits. And on top of that, the significant amount of franking credits to be refunded because because the fund is paying 15% tax and you are getting approximately 30% or 28% or 29% of the franking credits, you still have a significant amount of refund after paying the tax to the ATO. But this thing can be significantly better if you are in pension phase because you are literally not paying any tax on that income uh, and you will get the 100% franking credits back. So mm -hmm. with the pension, um, your tax refunds would be significant, which you can utilize that refund to reinvest into the shares, um, and then you will have the compounding effect of the dividends over the years because your tax savings will be reinvested, and that will generate the more refunds. Yeah. So if I if I have CBA shares, for example, I get seventy dollars as a dividend from CBA in a super fund. I'll get at least another fifteen dollars as a tax refund if I'm not in pension phase. If I'm in pension phase, I get thirty dollars back from the tax department. So effectively, I either receive 85 or, or $100 when most other people only have 70. Big difference. Big difference, yes, mm. yes. So the key takeaways from uh, the self-finance super fund side of it is the SMSF is a part of the wealth creation strategy and not a wealth creation strategy itself. <clears throat> because you, if you can utilize the self-finance super fund as a part of your overall strategy, then it can be really effective. Uh, at least annually take a time to understand how the superannuation fund rules would benefit you because it changes regularly. Uh, you need to be uh, on top of the matters uh, because sometimes it can be really, really effective uh, if you want to utilize the latest uh, legislative changes. Uh, at the basic level, SMSF is a lower tax entity, but there are lots of exceptions and rules. Uh, that's exactly right. Sometimes uh, just the tax savings shouldn't be considered and the asset protection and the other consequences of making those decisions needs to be considered as well. So if you're thinking of any situation where apart from these slides, if you think that you can have a tax savings, please let us know and we will provide you more information because each and every situation, each and every member expectations and goals uh, are different and we can talk about your requirements on the basis and of the so situation. And those of you that do have self-managed super funds, you may have noted uh, a bit more correspondence around uh, investment strategies, updating deeds, and some arm's length requirements with properties that are being used by, you know, say for a commercial property that's in a fund. That's all being driven by requirements from the ATO. Um, it's something that, again, we've taken on in-house to make sure that we're dotting the I's and crossing the T's, but um, just, letting you know that uh, it's in hand and it's not something that is um, necessarily driven just from us. It's making sure that none of you have an issue with the ATO when they come or if they come calling. Cool. Back to me? Yes, please. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. So the um, our, our tax journey is is about efficiency 
so if we can have an average tax rate over our entire journey of a certain figure, it's a much better proposition than a lumpy one year I'm at 47, next year I'm at 10, next year I'm at 47, next year I'm at 10. That causes all sorts of headaches. So part of what today's messaging was about is, uh, as we touched on, it, it's not just this time of the year. This time of the year is a, because it's a close of the financial year, it's kind of a reminder of things we may need to consider. But um, that smoothing of our tax, the getting the best after-tax outcome that we can using superannuation or prepayments or whatever other timing opportunities are in place, um, we do utilise, but we don't do that in one particular year at the cost of another. It needs to be in, so anything we do this year needs to be in context to the potential impact on, on next year. So, but this just outlines what our potential tax rates are, as Neil has indicated, the after-tax available investment amount in a superannuation environment is somewhere between $100 and $85. Uh, in a company, it's $70 and individual rates, if you're on the top tax rate, it's um, it's a $53 investment that you have, op um, have available after tax. So clearly, if you can get your savings into a, um, a lower taxed environment, you're going to have a far better investment outcome than you would um, as an alternative. And again, as Neil has indicated, all of these things need to be balanced out with asset protection and estate planning and all these sorts of things, uh, which go hand in glove with this sort of planning that we do. It's not just about tax, just as tax is just one, one part of the jigsaw.